We'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our indigenous and first people of the land and space in which we live and breathe. For our community at Highland College, we recognize that we are on stolen and occupied Duwamish, Kosahalish, Muckleshoot, and Puyallup lands. And we want to thank all the, um, the relations and tribes today as we provide or as we prepare to hold space as our community. We recognize that we all use our joining conversations from different locations through Zoom. And so let us acknowledge, oops, oops. and let us acknowledge the indigenous and the, the first people of the land and spaces in which we cur currently occupy. Further, we represent, respectfully acknowledge the enslaved people, primarily of the African descent who, provide, who provided exploited labor on which the country was built with the little to no recognition. Today, we are indebted to our labor and our labor of many black and brown bodies that continue to work in the shadows of our collective benefit. And as we begin, I'll pass this to Edwina. Thank you, Genoa. Talofa lava, aloingo, Edwina Fui. Good morning, community. My name is Edwina Fui, and I serve as the interim director at the Center for Cultural and Inclusive Excellence. And I have the privilege of chairing this year's Unity Week 2022. This week, we have three presenters and four opportunities to engage, reflect, and be together in community. I invite our Highline family and community to bring whatever you need and to just be as we dive into conversations throughout this week. Our theme, Lean on Me, Embracing Humanity as a Radical Act of Resistance, was chosen for the action of seeing the humanity in one another while leaning into our connection and responsibility as a collective. So I ask that you lean in listen and embrace the conversation. Before I close, I have to give a special shout out to a few folks. Um, first, shout out to Rachel Collins and Bob Heyer for their continued, continued support in creating these virtual spaces, all the Zoom webinar links set up and coordinating um, anything that we needed for our, for our events. We appreciate you for your time and efforts to document and share the content. And of course, I have to give a huge shout out to the squad and this year's committee Betty Vera, Dr. Daryl Bryce, Doris Martinez, Gio Mark Pinello, Georgia Peary, Genoa Wingo, Monica Tork, Dr. Sean McFessel, and Samantha Atienza. Thank you so much for your time in organizing this week. I am extremely grateful for the collective effort and the hard work of these folks. So much love and gratitude to each of you. And now I would like to pass the mic to Dr. Bryce to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Good morning, Highline community and beyond. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Derek Greenfield today. Dr. Greenfield was on the very first Unity Week committee 25 years ago, and he recruited me to Highline 19 years ago. Dr. Greenfield is a nationally recognized thought leader, speaker, and educator with an award-winning career in academia that has included successful stints as a full-time faculty member, eight years at Highline College, vice president for student engagement and campus life, and two-time chief diversity officer. His interactive, powerful workshops and keynotes have inspired and informed audiences at over 250 colleges and universities, as well as industry leaders such as CBS Sports, Visa, Progress Energy, and the NBA's Milwaukee Bucks. In addition to publishing a lengthy list of peer-reviewed journal articles and chapters, Dr. Greenfield is co-editor of the book, Exploring Issues of Diversity Within HBCUs. He earned his BA and MA in sociology from Northwestern University, as well as two doctoral degrees, a PhD in cultural studies from the University of Washington, and an EdD from Cape Peninsula University of Technology in South Africa. So please welcome the great Dr. Derek Greenfield. You know, it kind of hits me emotionally, 25 years of the celebration, unity through diversity, 
And I was blessed to serve on the first planning committee. Like we gave birth to a beautiful baby and watched others guide its growth exponentially. I'm so honored to be asked to return home and be part of continuing this legacy. And if there ever were a time to lean on me, to resist hegemony and psychological tyranny by embracing our full humanity, to live authentically, completely unapologetically, it's definitely now when confused folks around the country are trying to silence voices seeking equity and to deny history I mean, creating animosity by banning a theory, CRT. I mean, we need to move with intentionality and empathy quickly, like ASAP, because we have to address the trauma in this country. To heal wounds deep in our psyche, shape minds, hearts, and souls for eternity, change behaviors so that we'll have no need for another hashtag RIP for black men killed unjustly, to provide safety and security for trans folks being attacked simply for living free, for eradicating the hate we've seen experienced by our Asian brothers and sisters and our collective family. We got work to do, y'all feel me? And we need everyone, whether you're a member of the AARP, the NAACP, the HRC, or the JCC, whether you watch ABC or NBC, prefer the WWE or the MLB, we got to collectively apply CPR to revive the idea of hope. Because you see, in the midst of this spirit societal plight, the universe needs more moments of joy and delight. This Zoom choir, it's more than self-care. I'm talking communities of care where we truly unite to heal one another with all our might in spite or despite what some try to tell us. The skin you're in is beautiful and your mind is brilliant this morning like sunlight. Stay encouraged. Stay encouraged and committed because we can't allow oppression to become a, a permanent parasite. We got to be like electrolytes, supercharged to fight the good fight. Be truth tellers who use an ultraviolet light to expose what ain't right even even when some think it's impolite, please continue to persevere. Keep alive the guiding light, remembering to keep believing in you. That's your human rights. Our dream of truth, racial healing, and transformation, no stoplight, because we can't sit tight. It's go time, green light. Change may seem slow at times. It won't happen overnight. Yet keep illuminating the path forward and move towards the light. But you got to buckle up the seatbelt nice and tight, and because uh, the road ahead may have a few bumps in sight, but stay upright, spirit bright, mind erudite, because we will reach our full heights. Stay hungry for new knowledge and feed off inclusion, full appetite. No need to nibble at this work. Take the whole damn bite. And sometimes folks who aren't about the social justice life might need to be temporarily left behind because we got to go right. We have no time to sit around playing theoretical games like Fortnite. Nah, you got to have the foresight to take action today so we can plan together for an explosive future like dynamite. Your greatness, it's your birthright. If others are sadly blind, you lead by example with your 2020 eyesight. If others are asleep in the darkness, you stay culturally woke carrying your flashlight. And if folks are trying to take us back to the not so good old days using rear view mirrors, you keep your headlights focused ahead on a future so bright even the moon looks like daylight. I mean, we may fall at times, but like a meteorite, land strong and make an impact on the world outright. You can get up with new insights and fly high like a kite through a thunderbirds because those naysayers, their bark is bigger than their bite. But together, Highline, we are more powerful than a million terabytes. It's hard work, but when our positivity level is low like Celsius, folks like Dr. Bryce will help you heat back up like Fahrenheit. And when society's spiritual soda machine tastes flat, I have confidence that someone here today will be the model of great energy like that fire McDonald's Sprite. We have faced some challenges, but this morning, today, and into tonight, we've got to commit to ignite hope, excite one another, and expedite real change. Keep the faith. We got this, all right? Good morning. I am truly honored to be here with you and what an amazing opportunity. Dr. Bryce and the whole committee, I remember 25 years ago. I remember being that, that young guy there on the Highline campus, and we felt as a group of new folks who would come that, that the change was possible, that we could indeed be part of transforming an institution to be, and as we now know, Highline being the most diverse college that you're going to find in the state, a place indeed with so many dynamic programs and courses and experiences and a commitment to embedding social justice everywhere. I am honored to be back. So thank you. It is so great to see in the chat box some of my former colleagues. I look a little older. You don't. You look great. And I'm just again so thrilled 
thrilled that we have a chance to share a little bit today and indeed your theme which I think is just so wonderful, uh, uh, indeed, about leaning on me. We're going to get back to that in a moment. So we're going to talk about getting better together. Do me a favor. Everybody, if you could reach your hands in the air as high as you can. Let's get a good stretch. It's a Monday morning. we got to stretch. Reach as high as you can in the air. All right, now reach higher. Reach a little higher. Okay, you can put your hands down. Now, now reach higher if you actually reached higher when I asked you to do so. But remember, I asked you to reach as high as you could the first time. So we're going to stretch ourselves. We've Indeed, in the spirit of authentic identities, you know, a lot of times, young people, you talk about keeping 100. A lot of us keep it only about 20. And so I'm going to encourage you today and for this journey this week and throughout our lives to really celebrate the power of our authentic identities. When we can truly be who and whose we are. We can reach a little bit higher, reach out a little bit more, and even get more done because we are in challenging times. You've seen, obviously, these incidents that have been taking place all over the country, anti-LGBTQ uh, events that are, that are happening. We know that indeed the, the rise of anti-Asian hate, what a lot of people don't know, 70% of, in the spirit of intersectionality, to recognize that 70% of the attacks on our Asian American brothers and sisters are actually against women. And so this is an intersectional issue around inequity and injustice and intolerance, and it continues to grow. We know that in Seattle, hate crimes continue to soar, and this is a very recent statistic. So this is the challenge that we're in, y'all. We know that legislation across the country continues to take shape, and maybe you feel a little insulated uh, there in, in, in an area that tends to be a little more progressive, but for someone like myself traveling this country, I, I see it everywhere I turn, that we know that we are whitewashing the history books and that some people are scared to have these true authentic conversations that children are being told that who you are doesn't matter and, and you don't belong and that there's something wrong with you and we will punish you out of that we we've got to be able to have spaces where we can celebrate indeed their children being used as pawns to to fight against what we know is good for us to talk about the injustice to talk about healing and to talk about coming together and indeed I, I happen to look at some of these math books that have actually been banned in, and, and this is a wonderful example. And, and, and this is a, a book that was banned now in Florida for being too, I, I don't know, progressive or understanding. And what an interesting notion. I, I wish I had learned math when we were challenged to actually think about that there's multiple ways to do math, right? Many of us were taught you either do it this way or you get no credit. And if you don't show your work, you get punished. I have a friend of mine who is a, a beautiful and wonderful individual, and she has a son who didn't show his work on a math assignment and got in trouble. He was told that he must have been cheating. She comes in and says, you're just mad that a young black male whose grandfather was a carpenter and learned to do math in his head. He said, there's generational genius that courses through the veins of our family. And you as a teacher don't see that. You believe that because he doesn't do it your way, he might not be smart and intelligent. She said, guess what? Let's put a problem up. You put a problem on the board and my son and you will do it at the same time. She's showing all her work and he does it in his head. And she says, look, look how brilliant and genius my son is and you couldn't envision him being as smart as he is. We got to look at the fact that maybe another reason that book was, was banned because they actually dared to speak the name of all those brilliant BIPOC men and women who have made contributions in math throughout history but have often not been acknowledged. We've got to recognize that when we're asking children their math biography, and what a wonderful way to teach math, these, these really inclusive strategies where people own their authentic identity and say, here's how I feel about her. Here's what I have learned about math in my life. And when children can own that, and indeed, this is the best way for them to overcome some of perhaps their imposter syndrome or fears. This is a way for us to help them to connect math to the genius that happens in their family and their communities and that indeed people are afraid of what is called social emotional learning but we all learn when we feel connected and guess what if some of these folks are so afraid that maybe white children will have to learn about some of the historical pain, well, guess what? There are black and brown children every single day who feel uncomfortable every day in class. And indeed, the research actually shows that white teachers with black students are three times more negative. So if we want to talk about discomfort. There are some children every single day who are feeling discomfort. And we've got to acknowledge that we can talk about it. Maybe we can actually make some change. So I invite you today and the activities we will do in a moment, I'll put you into breakout room to use the chat feature to be our true and authentic selves, our true and authentic selves so that maybe we can overcome some of the negativity that we find ourselves in a world. And the great Audrey Lord, when we can indeed speak, we're often afraid, but when we're silent, we're still afraid. So it's better to speak. And when we dare to be powerful, 
becomes less and less important when I'm afraid. Dr. Bryce, I thought about, you know, the first time I ever was out was at Highline College. I've never done a presentation like this where I actually talked about it. And I'm a little nervous. I mean, who knows who's watching? This is recorded. And I, professionally, I, I've never owned that space and that identity in a public setting because of fears of what people. But if I'm talking about the importance of all of us being authentic, let me go first. And Highline was the place where I actually could be my true and full authentic self of being out and knowing that this is a community that would support and love and my own liberation, which I gave myself as a birthday present on my 30th birthday at Highline. I'm still working on it. I'm still working on recovering, having lived in the South and in other places where indeed I fought myself to be my true authentic self. Well, today begins the first day of the rest of my life and living authentically and freely. And it becomes less important, I'm afraid, and more important that indeed we're there for one another and can lead by example. Indeed, as Sherry Porter talked about, authenticity is an act of resistance. That ties into your theme for this week. And indeed, when we can truly be our authentic and all the unapologetic self, there's such great power in being you. So Highline, being this amazing place, let's continue to inspire each other. You inspire me. One of the amazing things that I felt about Highline is you had this incredible diversity of life experiences. Folks who were 18 and and not sure if they belonged in college but realized how their genius operated. 75-year-olds learning English for the first time and and they could find that's so inspiring. We had first generation and, and those who had had generations of college within their families. Folks who indeed walked into classrooms every single day not knowing if they truly would find anybody like themselves but persevered and faculty and staff who continue to fight even despite what they'd encountered in the world to say, I will give my life so that this next generation can feel better. If you don't mind dropping in the chat box something that inspires you about Highline or someone who inspires you at Highline, drop that name, drop that program, drop that experience, drop that idea. Let's share for a moment that indeed in this space, as a collective family, there is so much to celebrate, so much to be inspired by, and so much that indeed we can be honored by. Let's get that chat box flooded. Think about the people, the things, the programs, the experiences. I love it, I love it. Think about, and we'll do more of this at the end, but let's begin this journey of what does it mean to you to be in this space? Who inspires you and what inspires you? What keeps us going when indeed we realize all the challenges that we're facing? There's a lot of good stuff. And I love these names and I love these ideas. And we're going to do that throughout this session because we need it, especially at these moments of challenge. As the late, great spiritual leader and philosopher Thich Nhat Hanh said, be beautiful means to be yourself. You don't have to be accepted by others. Just be and accept the beautiful original you. There has never been anybody in the history of the world created before like you. There will never be another you. You got something special the world has never seen before, will never see again. Let that light shine. I love this example uh, of Rawiri Watini in New Zealand, who is a politician in the parliament there, and he said, I'm going to wear my Jordans. And when he faced all this political backlash, he said, let me be clear, not all of the people here, uh, my folks that I represent, they don't wear suits and ties. We wear Jordans. I grew up wearing Jordans. I'm going to represent me and who I am because there's some people, the least those who are marginalized the most, need to know that somebody who can relate to them is speaking for them in the places of power and speaking truth to power. Be that true, identic, uh, authentic self. Indeed, this quote many of us have heard that was delivered by Nelson Mandela, but actually from Marion Williamson, that indeed, who am I, we sometimes wonder, to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and famous. Who are you not to be? That we're all meant to shine. And when we let our light shine, when we can live authentically, when we're able to say, I'm proud of who I am and will be that, we let other people know that they can do the same. People are watching. You've got little brothers and sisters and cousins and nieces and nephews watching you. And when you go for your dreams and when you live in your authentic truth, you let them know it's possible. And for people who say you're too much, you got too many colors, you're too loud, you're too this, you're too that, you're bringing too many of these issues to the forefront, well, maybe you you remind them of this beautiful poem by Nikita Gill that maybe they're just too little to appreciate that it took an entire galaxy being woven into one soul to make you. So be you to not be afraid to to be yourself, be authentic. Because if we are not, 
It's killing us. This picture was from my high school friend. And I'm speaking actually at Cornell University right now for the rest of this day. And my friend went to Cornell. And during our first year in college, he sent me a, we used to actually do a thing called write handwritten letters. And he wrote me a long letter and shared some personal things. And it was just a beautiful gesture. And he signed it at the end, Love Bill. I read that letter and I wrote a response back. And at the end of the letter, I paused and I said, well, I don't know if men are supposed to say love to each other. And I just signed it, Derek. My friend Bill had a, I think I might have gotten muted for a second there. My friend had a terminal illness and he passed away just a few months later. That was my last interaction with him. And I had held back by saying love to him because I thought at that time that's not what men did. If we do not live authentically, if we are caught up in some societal norms of what others tell us we're supposed to be, it literally kills us. It takes away our spirit and it keeps us from loving and being the best version of ourselves. That's why I love the change we're seeing in the world that states across the country, the Crown Act is saying, guess what? That those who have faced discrimination on the job for wearing natural and authentic, be you. And that net needs to be taken down. We have seen folks speaking out on LinkedIn. I love this example of a woman who said, you know, and in my job, uh, I wanted to apply for bereavement leave, but because it was my uncle who passed, I was told by the company that only applies to immediate family. She said, but wait a minute, in my family, is he, my, my eldest uncle who passed away, that is my immediate family. In our culture, that's how things work. See, if you apply the culture that you operate under, maybe that doesn't fit, but my uncle mattered at that level. You see, equity is different from equality. Equality treating everybody the same. Equality is giving everybody a shoe, but equity is giving everybody a shoe that fits. And if we don't look at some of our policies and practices, we're keeping people from fitting in, and she would not have been able to access the same rights she had as somebody else. But luckily, she had a supervisor and an HR company policy that changed because she spoke up lived authentically, and others were willing to acknowledge the importance of change. I love this quote from somebody who works in the corporate sector and says, when we truly create a culture of inclusivity, people know there are no barriers to what they can personally and professionally achieve by bringing their full and authentic self every day. We all deserve that. The Zulu tribe, when people greet each other, they say the word sawabona. And Sawabona, yes, hello, what's up? But literally, by definition, it means I see you. And when we see each other and fully honor each other, and we realize we encourage people by seeing them, that we tell them and show them and make sure they can be authentically themselves, something special happens. Let me play this little video. A guy named Michael Jr., he's a comedian, and partway through his comedy act, he does a thing called Break Time, where he just stops and says, all right, let me, let me just meet people from the crowd, and random, spontaneous things happen. This guy is a music instructor at a military academy. He says, sing Amazing Grace. Watch what happens. When we connect, and when people can go there and be their true, authentic self, something beautiful happens the second time versus the first. Amazing. Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That brought could sing. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Um, now, once you give me the version, is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail. You got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that
He took us there, and I'm not sure if those two men at the end would have hugged like that. There's something that happens when people can be free to go there, to be the best versions of themselves. You know, I do a lot of speaking across the country for athletics departments. And about five years ago, I speak to the Kansas State Wildcat football team. And at the end of the session, the young men are sharing openly, and it was powerful and transformative what they were offering to one another. And this young man, as time was up, I said, hey, we got to go. He goes, please, I need to say something. And he's shaking, six foot five, 320 pound offensive lineman, walking up in front of the room, shaking, almost convulsing. And his teammates said, well, what's up? We got you, Scott. Now, he shared this since publicly, so I can tell you this story. Scott Franz gets up in front of his teammates and says, teammates, I'm going to tell you something I've never told anybody in my life. Number two, I picked out the date next month that I'm going to kill myself. The room was pin drop quiet. One of the most powerful moments I've ever experienced. And one by one, like a movie, those young men on the team were standing up like popcorn, popping up, saying, Scott, don't you ever be ashamed to be here yourself. We got you. We love you. We got your back. Everybody rushed. We're hugging and crying. And Scott says, I never thought I could be my true, authentic self. Scott Franz had planned to kill himself. But by taking a risk to be his authentic self, by his teammates who supported him, embraced him in the spirit of love as an act of resistance to the world, he said, who had tried to tell him he didn't matter. He said, team. I've spent my life hearing from my family, my church, my community, my school. He said, anytime you represent a marginalized group, you hear everything everybody says. He said, sometimes in the locker room, you guys have said these jokes and everybody apologized and said, we know we've been wrong. We, we want to make this right. We're hugging and crying. Scott Franz was going to be dead, but his teammates saved his life. Can't we do that for each other every day? Can't we find a way to let people be their authentic selves and show them how much we love them and let them know, I got your back no matter what. A year later, Scott Franz came out publicly on ESPN, the first openly gay Division I football player. And indeed, as he said on ESPN, how much closer he was to his teammates, how amazing the experience has been. His teammates started to tweet how proud they were from Scott Franz didn't play a single down before he came out. He had not played a single down on the field, but when his teammates rallied around him, see, inclusive excellence, when people can be who they are, they're better. When the world of weight, sh uh, the world of pain that they've experienced is lifted from their shoulders, you can run faster and you can jump higher. When you know people got your back, you, you fight a little bit harder on that one yard line Scott Franz who hadn't played before he came out his teammates saved his life his courage saved his life and helped him become an all-star player his team won twice as many games the next year but maybe even though he was expected to go to the NFL the the league perhaps a couple years ago was too much homophobia. Well, we know this past year things are, are changing, y'all. Even when we see all of this negative reaction from some segments of our society, we got to know that hearts and minds have changed. See, Scott Franz could not get drafted at that time. The league wasn't ready, but we know just a few months ago, Carl Nassib comes out as the first openly gay NFL player, and the league not only responded with positivity, but recognized and honored him. We are seeing some change. And we've got to keep fighting for that change because everyone has a story. Everyone's story deserves to be heard. So I'm going to ask you to grab your cell phones for a moment. Take your cell phone out for a second. And I'm going to use a little activity here that hopefully will come up on your screen right now. And uh, you are going to, let me just do a quick little shift to this. What I'm going to ask you to do is go to your text messaging. And at your text messaging, i like you, as you see the phone number here, 37607, you're going to send a message to that phone number. So just go to your text messaging, no area code, no 253 or 206, just type 37607 as the recipient for your text message. Now, in the text box, I'd like you to type just the number you see and leave it there for a moment where you would type words or emojis, type the number you see, 64403. So no words, no emojis, just 64403 for now. Not hitting send yet. If you didn't hit send, just go back and type another one. So 37607 is the phone number. 64403 is the text. And after the 64403, I'd like you to type your answer to the following question. What is one thing about you that is so central to who you are, an identity you hold, an experience you've been through, past or present, painful or promising? What is one thing that is so central, like Scott Franz talked about 
that identity for him, being gay? What is something so central to who you are, but nobody at Highline knows about it? And when you type it out, not just one word, you can type 5, 10, 15 words. When you type it out after 64403 and hit send, it'll come up anonymously in the screen. No names, no phone numbers, just the real authentic you. So if you could do that right now, what is something about you that nobody at Highline knows, but it is so important? And let's take a look at who we are as a community. And obviously, I'll ask people to make sure that they, and be, you can be specific. What does it mean to be an immigrant? You can talk about that. You can give us a little bit more. I, I know that we'll all be thoughtful and not do something silly. I never had that problem. But let's just really honor our collective space. This is who we are. And even the things that might be painful, some of you, these have been your superpowers. And, and indeed, there's so much we can learn from each other. When those who have been survivors, if we could create a space for you to feel safe to be your authentic self, we can learn from you. We can help you heal, but you can teach us. You can share maybe there's things that we say or do that you hope that we no longer do. We can learn by our authentic truth. There's so much that we have gone through. And yet you're still here. So think of this as your superpower. Think of this as your opportunity to say, despite what I've been through, I am here. I deserve to be here, and I'm going to make it through this. And maybe if we can be a little more vulnerable, maybe if we encourage people and tell people, I'll go first, let me share, I got your back. Maybe if that hugging as a love language will allow us to say, Let's talk honestly. Maybe we can let go of some of that burden. Maybe we can live a little bit healthier. Maybe we can love and let people in. Maybe we can heal each other and we can learn from each other and celebrate. Celebrate who we are. To learn to move from being ashamed to be a white male to actually saying, how can I use that as a motivator to engage me in the struggle for change so I can be proud to be a contributor not just as an ally, but a co-conspirator, as an accomplice for change and take pride in the movements you've made. There's so much here. There's so much more to us. And maybe if we can talk a little bit more, and we'll do that towards the end of the session, maybe if we could just be our true authentic selves, maybe we'll be a better Highline family. Maybe if we remember all the things we've heard and ensure that our language is always thoughtful and loving when we interact with each other, even when we're frustrated, if we take a pause and say, the person I'm speaking with may be on that screen, and I've got to give love. I've got to give love. So thank you for your courage. If in the chat box there's anything you're thinking and feeling, Please drop in the chat box any thoughts or comments, things you want to offer to our collective community in this moment of courage, in this moment, indeed, where we're saying we can be our authentic selves and we got each other and we've got to fight just that little bit harder for one another. Let's see if there's some chat box comments. I would love to see if anybody wants to offer something at this moment. Indeed, as Katie mentioned, we, we are more alike than we realized. Our similarities bring us together. Our differences make us smarter and stronger. If we can indeed find some common ground, then we can understand even more how we experience it in similar and different ways. Then we'll know better how to fight for each other. See, the golden rule, treat people the way you want to be treated. I prefer the platinum. Platinum is worth more than gold. And the platinum rule is treat people the way they want to be treated. We've got to think about it. We've got to know each other, Savavona, to see each other and to really know there are places all throughout this campus where people got your back, where people will love you, and that we can be better together. We're going to have to take some risks to have some tough conversations, take some risks to be our authentic self. Anybody here sing in the shower but not in public? Is anybody sing in the shower but not in public? Let me see if we have a hand raise or someone who says in the chat box, anybody sing in the shower but not in public? Who do we got here? Uh, all right. All right, Kay Williams. Kay Williams, Empress, Queen, and Boss. If you're a boss and you're a queen and Empress, come up off of mute. Let me hear you. Let me see you. Where, where, is, where is our friend Kay Williams who said that maybe? Where's Kay Williams? Say hello to us. Where are you at, Kay Williams? 
Where you at? Where you at? Come up off of the mute. Come up onto the screen. Come on. Is this Carmen? All right. Come on, Carmen. Where you at? Uh, where, where you at, Carmen? You, you said maybe let's, if we're going to truly be authentic selves and risk takers, uh, let's see if we can have a little bit of fun. Where, where's Carmen at? Is there someone else if Carmen is not, oh, she can't unmute. Sorry about that. Anybody else who uh, is, are we not able to unmute? Can we, can we do that for folks? Can we unmute people, please? Uh, those who are facilitating our tech, if you can let people be unmuted. All right. She'll be able to now. Carmen, let's see. Can you unmute now? Where are you at? I'm not sure if Carmen can unmute. Carmen, can you unmute? Can anybody unmute? Let me hear from anybody. Uh, yeah. There we go. Okay. Hey, Laura Manning. I need everybody to unmute. Everybody to unmute. My good friend, Laura Manning. Well, I want to put it on you then because uh, you're going to sing for us. I think she just said shit. I don't know. Um, so, so Laura Manning, <laughs> here's what I need you to do. Everybody unmute. Everybody make some noise for Laura Manning because she's going to, she's volunteering. Here for her. You can do it. Go, Laura. Go, Laura. Hi, Laura. So here's what we're going to do, Laura. I need you to start us off. And you're just going to sing the first three words to lean on me. All right. With all that highline pride, you'll go lean on me. And then we're going to all join in. Everybody stay up on, on the mic. No mutes. Everybody, we're all going to sing in one hot Zoom mess. We're going to sing as a family because we do. It's the title of your week, Highline Through Diversity theme, Lean On Me. Well, let's sing Lean On Me and we'll do it together. So, Laura, give us the first three words with all that pride and then we'll all sing and join you. Go for it. Laura, where are you at? Oh, now it says they can't unmute. Ah, tech now folks. We can. Now All, we right. Can. All right, I think we're good now. I think we should be able to unmute. Okay. So, Laura, are you there? I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. All right, Laura Manning, are you there? I'm here. All right, start us off and let's all sing together. Everybody unmute. Lean on me when, when you're not home. I'll be your friend. friend. I'll, I'll help help you live long. Oh, it won't be long. Be long. Well, I'm, I'm gonna do me. me. I'm somebody burning me. You just call on the superstar when you need a hand. You don't need somebody to me. I just might have a problem with you. I don't need somebody to me. No, no, no. Noise for Laura Manning! <laughs> <laughs> you know, it might have been like, oh, and if you notice it's moments when we listened a little deeper, we actually got in sync. And that's the spirit that I want to make sure that we have. Because you know what? Diversity is a fact, but inclusion requires us to act. We know, and I, I've spent, I've been living in the Dominican Republic for a while now, and I took Spanish classes. I've gotten a little better. We know that when we act towards building inclusive worlds where we understand, when we take risks to learn about other people and their realities, it actually benefits us. Bilingualism is great socially, emotionally, and even our brains are better. So literally reaching out to each other, leaning on each other makes us better together. When there are folks who can inspire us, Bree Newsom, who, as you may recall from a couple of years ago, went up the South Carolina state flagpole there in front of the legislature to take that Confederate flag down to say, you know what, we will take risks for change. And indeed, this young man at Mississippi State, I lived in Mississippi, and for generations we've tried to get rid of that Confederate flag, and this young man said, y y you change the flag or I won't represent the state. And literally within weeks, the state legislature voted on a new flag. It's possible, young people. Indeed, it's always been young people who have been the movers and shakers that if we indeed have the courage to live authentically and fight for change. Maybe some of you had a chance to watch this video during the past week of a woman who talked about as a white, straight, Christian mom, her responsibility to fight for change her responsibility to be part of it. I'm having a little challenge bringing that up, but maybe I'll play it at the end, because if we want to see a better world, we've got to be that change. 
And, and indeed, you, maybe you've heard that at 211 degrees, you got hot water, but 212 it boils. It can have steam. It can be purified. It can power a locomotive. I'm just going to challenge you to make one degree of difference, to reach out a little bit more to think about ways to be inclusive in everything you do. I, I'm Jewish, my son is Muslim, fun home. And I used to teach at a Southern Baptist University. The story gets better. But the chaplain would close all his prayers by saying, to whom you pray, for me it is Jesus. He honored his own faith but acknowledged, Sawabona, I see you. I want everybody to know to whom you pray that everybody is welcome. There's little things we can do every single day. You know, I... Think about my story, my parents, and eight years ago I was teaching at a college in North Carolina and graduation, so many of my students were first generation to graduate, so it was a special day and my brother called and said, get home tonight, dad's not gonna make the night. With the cancer that had taken over his body, I'd visited him a week before and he was doing well, but it had quickly changed and I rushed on two planes. I, I can remember getting off the plane in the car that drove us, the, the door we went in, the elevator, that was on my birthday. And I rushed to get to the hospital before my dad passed away and I got a hug from him I'll never forget. He couldn't speak at that point. I, I had a good relationship but there are things that I wanted to tell him, things I wanted to share with him, things I wanted to talk to but I, I waited too long. Don't wait too long to tell people how much you love them. Don't wait too long for your own liberation. Don't wait too long to speak your own truth. My dad couldn't talk, but he, we took turns giving him kisses all night long. And he was fighting all night long, and I didn't understand why. Six months later, my mom told me that that morning he had woken up and said, I will not die on my son's birthday. He knew it was my birthday, so he was fighting all night long. There was no chance to, to make it, to stay alive much longer. He just didn't want me to remember every birthday with his death, and he made it a little while longer. He gave me that gift. There have been people giving us gifts, y'all. I want you to think about who's that person who has been that gift giver, whose authentic example has inspired you and you need to let them know how much you appreciate them. Do it today. Call them, text them, whatever you do, but let them know how much they matter to you. And for those who haven't thought about it, you are that for somebody else. Whether you realize it or not, there are people are watching. Whom do you want to make sure by following your example, you let them know that the world is available to them, that whoever they are is beautiful, brilliant, and loved, and you will shine and be that example for them. You see, maybe if we just share our stories more, like you saw on the poll everywhere screen from texting. The research is clear. When we tell stories, we remember more. We connect more. We indeed have greater empathy. Is this individual, a DIAA CREP CEO, the Sunder Brown Ducket says, when I want to bring the best version of myself, when, when we lead with authenticity, when we share our vulnerable moments, it opens up everybody else to share their real life too. So let's take a risk. I'm going to put you in some breakout rooms for five minutes, and then we'll do a quick wrap-up to get you out in time for your next hour. But for five minutes, I'm just going to ask you for everybody to take 45 seconds to say, this is my story. To take off those masks, the figurative masks that hold us back. And just for 45 seconds to a minute, say, let me tell you about the real me. And just be you. Whatever part of your story you want to share, maybe there's something inspiring that we'd all be moved and motivated by just knowing what you've overcome. Or maybe right now you're facing a challenge and you just want to be you and have a space where you feel loved by our community. Everybody gets 45 seconds to a minute to share their story. Now, before you get started, try something fun really fast. Maybe you've seen these videos of teachers that have a unique handshake with all their students and every student feels special. I want your group to take just 20 seconds and virtually come up with a fun handshake that just connects you. Have a little fun for 20 seconds on the camera to do a little fun handshake that binds you together. And then we'll take about five minutes for everybody to go around. This is my story. And then we'll close and celebrate together and wrap up after that. So if we could just take five minutes, I'm going to put you into some breakout rooms now. And I'll ask you to just be you. Take a chance, whatever it is you want to share, to let people know that this is a place where we can truly honor and affirm each other. And after each person shares, cheer for them. Let them know they're loved. So quick handshake, 45 seconds a minute each person. This is my story and cheer and celebrate that we are a community that loves together. So if you could click on the button that says join, you can join the breakout room, and we'll see you in five minutes for a quick wrap up to the session today. Right, welcome back, I hope you had a chance to just connect and be reminded of the people in this space that we collectively share some amazing 
experiences and to be there and be inspired by each other, to lift each other up, to encourage and love on each other. And anytime you see each other on campus, give them that handshake to let them know they belong and that they matter. And indeed, maybe instead of debating ideas and, and try to figure out who's got the right belief system, maybe we just start with sharing our experiences. And if we just listen to each other as we share our stories, we can learn so much from each other by storytelling, so much by hearing each other's experience. There's so much knowledge in there and there's so much love. Indeed, what researchers found when people share stories, their brain waves become connected. They literally begin operating on a similar brain wave, which allows them to feel and hear and learn from each other. So here's what I like to do as we wrap up. Uh, in the spirit of the 2003 Nobel Peace Prize winner, Wangari Maathai, it is a time for us to reach a little bit higher, to get that moral ground, to have that heightened consciousness, to shed our fear and give hope to each other. I challenge you to live and be the authentic you. All the gifts that you've been given and all the genius you offer to this world, please. And if you can share your authentic truth, we can all learn so much from each other. So I want to wrap up by continuing what we did earlier and encouraging everybody to get in that chat box. And I want to see it flooded with as many people as we can compliment. As many, put their name and what you appreciate about them. I want to see this chat box completely lit up with names and why. The people in this room, do three, four, five, six, ten of them. I want to see a chance for everybody to know that indeed I'm loved and celebrated. So get into the chat box if you could. Type someone's name, what you appreciate, celebrate, love about them. I love it. Someone's light and love, your, your wisdom for believing in me, for their bravery, for caring for all our students. Keep it going because some people never get to hear it. Some people never get told that indeed they matter. And let's just get it going. It starts in the chat box, but it lives every day on our campus. When you see people, give them that hug or that love. Give them that compliment. Show up when they ask you to be there for them. Ask them, can we sit down and talk? If you see someone walking on campus alone, maybe ask if you can walk with them and just say, I'd love to get to know you. Because sometimes there are people that never feel like anybody got their back. And you become that agent of change. And as you see this love flowing through the chat box, Let's keep it going every single day. That's how we lean on each other. That's how indeed we speak truth as an act of resistance by being our authentic selves. And that's how we build a better campus, community, and world together. So I'm so honored that you've had a chance to share. I hope that you'll remember what you've seen and heard from each other, more even importantly than my voice. Collectively, we are stronger and smarter and wiser together. And that's why I wanted you to share your stories. And we continue to build the better and best community together. I love y'all. I thank you for allowing me to be here. And I wish you the very best for an amazing rest of the Unity Through Diversity Week, an outstanding year, and a life where you feel valued and affirmed and loved. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Greenfield. Appreciate that wonderful opening. Great start to Unity Through Diversity Week. And, you know, as always, Highline, you know, welcomes you back and was great to have you. So we were supposed to take a 10 minute break. Let's take a couple minute break so that y'all can have some Q&A. So we'll take a two minute break and then we'll come back with Q&A for Dr. Greenfield. If he's taught me anything is, you know, we just work with what we got. So we'll take a couple minutes breaks and then come back and start a Q&A with Dr. Greenfield. Let's see, any other questions? I'm trying to sneak through the chat box. Yeah, and I love, you know, I love that last comment, you know, for Doris and I've, I've you know, known Daryl for, for a long time. And indeed his, you know, his humility and his, the power of his example and his commitment, um, you know, to students is, is certainly legendary. And um, I'm, you know, I was just fortunate enough to, like I said, to, to have met him by accident, but by purpose. And that, as I mentioned, uh, to make that happen. What else? Do well, you have any questions there or anything? Let's just you and I chat for a little bit. What's yeah. good? Uh -huh. Sure. Thank you for all the love, man. Y'all are too much. Y'all are too much. But really, a lot of the credit is, you know, due to Greenfield, who had a vision that I didn't. I never wanted to come out with Sometimes it takes someone seeing a spark in us that others have not to ignite that fire. Absolutely. Because y'all need to see Dara Bryson in an interview.
because I'm going to tell it. I tell the real deal. Daryl Bryce did, I mean, uh, brilliant, right? That was not, but he had never done that type of an interview before. And so it was funny. Part of the interview that we say for folks is you have to act like this is a class and you're teaching. Well, it was a bunch of, you know, older, shall we say, majority older white men in the room uh, who weren't really, and Daryl was using this example and he brought in a football and it, he was talking, I mean, he was connecting sociology in these great ways. But he, he was struggling to, to treat them like they were students. He, he, he would talk to them like they were, you know, the elders. We were like, no, pretend we're a class. Uh, you know, it was just so wonderful to see. He didn't do a bad interview by any stretch, but it was an interview where he was just sort of nervous. And, and I think, that, you know, to find his voice and, and to know you do belong here. You are needed here. And so luckily, like I said, because we have that commitment from Jack Birmingham and others, we we're able to say no. What you saw was somebody who has all this genius and talent in them, had never been in that situation. The situation was awkward. The situation is not allowing people to be at their best. That's a fake situation, a pretend class. You put them in a real class, you'll see a dynamo. And indeed, once he got into his real class, that's what happened. Uh, I appreciate Gio's uh, you know, comment. Um, sometimes, you know, that I, I do recognize there are audiences that are just sifting through. We had a lot of emotional kinds of things that were talked about in that session where people poured their hearts out on the screen. At the end, they had a chance to share with each other. And so, uh, yeah, someone's saying they're struggling about being nervous. Yeah, yeah, Mark, yeah, I'm telling you. It was, uh, yeah, it was fun. But um, so someone talked about, let me see this question here. Enjoy being at work. How do you center yourself in positive joy and pleasure when you're in the midst of heaviness? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think that there's a couple of things. One, it is an act of resistance. It is an act of political action to center joy. Right? In a world that tries to tell you that you don't belong anymore, that's why the, that hashtag, you know, Black Boy Joy that we saw a couple of years ago, where people were saying, we're going to make sure that indeed we center this idea that just being a way to be happy, to celebrate the community that we do have, not always just worrying about what other people are doing. Sometimes we have to stop and say, we are part of a special beauty. It may be our family that grooms us joy. It may be having a chance to listen to music that just elevates your spirit. Whatever it is that brings you joy, center it create time for it, build it into your schedule if you need to, literally lock it in and say Tuesdays, you know, I'm gonna make Tuesdays from 10 to 11 my hour of joy, because not only do you need that to keep going, not only do you need that to maintain the spirit and the motivation for us to continue the good fight, but it actually is, as I said, a tool of resistance to not let forces that try to destroy us keep us from our own joy. So, so thanks for, you know, for that comment. Uh, I think, again, making it intentional, finding ways to do it, and getting a community of folks that remind you of it and will continue to hold you accountable for it. Build that network of individuals that really will make sure that you have joy. Every time I come into town, I try to make sure I go over to see, you know, Daryl and Yoshiko. I'm sorry, President Harden. Uh, uh, the, we celebrate for the great President Harden, who started. Now, yeah, I'm going to tell that story, too. Y'all don't know. But Yoshiko Harden worked in multicultural affairs in a position that had, obviously, great importance. But we're talking about there's a lot of levels. There's levels to this ish, right? I mean, she, at, at that point, I, we, none of us had thought we would be vice presidents and presidents. We were just doing this great work, but there are some amazing individuals in this space. And so I always make sure that I get to Daryl and Yoshiko's house and be around them, and we laugh, and we tell stories, and Daryl pokes fun at me, and we joke with each other, and, and we trash talk a little bit, and we love on each other because I need to be in their presence. I need to be surrounded by the love, watching Daryl with his children. And in particular, watch him with the son, right? And, and the notion of that love and to model what it looks like for men to truly love and show affection, for men to be vulnerable and open and honest, is life-changing. So be around the people that bring you that. And here it is. Let me see here. Thank you for, uh, for some of those other comments. Um, I'm scrolling through here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yoshiko is Yoshiko's the real deal. That's the real deal, you know? And that's someone who, who is never afraid to, well, or, or at least externally, make sure that when she walks into a space, 
I'm going to be my authentic self, like it or not, right? And so if anybody says, well, what's the consequence of that? President. <laughs> some, and, and that doesn't mean there haven't been hits. That doesn't mean that she hasn't taken some lumps and she hasn't you know, struggled and faced some challenges. You persevere. Now, there's a, a saying that some people have in some of their churches where they talk about in the fullness of time. And sometimes we get caught up in that moment right now. Right now it might not be good. In the fullness of time. Dr. King talked about that arc that bends toward justice. It may take some time, but we can get there. We can get there. Daryl had been applying for a lot of faculty positions and hadn't been getting a look. This, I mean, think about it. If you think about Daryl Bryce, he wasn't even getting interviews. He wasn't being considered. He applied to all these places to teach and kept going. And in the long run, look at the contribution that he's made. So, yeah. Uh, what other questions do you have? Yeah, yeah, Stephanie, feel free to ask uh, any questions you've got. No, don't hesitate. No, don't hesitate. Jump on in. I can talk about a million things, but I wanted to hear what um, inclusion is a leadership tool. Wonderful. James Payton. Oh, my gosh. Well, these names, he's blast from the past. He still looks like he's 25 now. Um, so uh, as a leadership tool, we know that inclusive leaders, there was some, a study that mentioned, and I could bring it up on my screen, but that inclusive leaders generate a 70% increase in psychological safety. So when people are around folks who would lead and lead with love and lead with inclusive, people feel safe. They feel like, okay, I can be me. And not only does that mean we can bring our authentic selves, it means we can take risks. When you feel valued, valued and included, it means you can, you can go there and try new ideas out because you know your safety. So as a leadership tool, one of the things we can do is make sure that everybody's voice gets heard. Leaders, make sure that in every meeting you use poll everywhere. And so when people say things like, you know, tell us what you really think, and people are afraid to say it out loud, they can put it there. All of us have had a boss or a professor that said, tell me what you really think about me. And we're like, I need my grade. I need this job. I can't really be honest. But if I can be honest in an anonymous space, then maybe I can really give. So inclusive leaders make sure they create space to hear all voices, especially ones that may challenge us, that push us in ways that are uncomfortable. And that's how we grow. And so that to me is so powerful. When we create spaces where everybody's voice is heard, we come up with better solutions. Racially diverse juries make better deliberations. They make fewer errors, research has found. So when we create space for all voices to get heard and acknowledge that we all learn and live and love differently, then everybody can get in. Let's see, who else, who else? Uh, Dr. Greenfield, I just realized I have the power to unmute and ask my question out loud instead of in the chat, which is easier okay. for me. <laughs> um, I, I have a question about career trajectory, kind of in a way, um, thinking about man, a lot of things like pleasure activism and having joy at work and feeling like, um, I know that it's true for a lot of people, like you were saying, uh, how Dr. Bryce applied at many places, and that's a lot of effort and hours of work each time you put in an application. And a lot of us put in so much sacrifice to, to be educators and to make it um, and then we get here, and I think what for me I found, Dr. Bettina Love uh, talks about the trauma that education causes as spirit murder, because school will murder your spirit. And I didn't realize that it would continue to spirit murder me when I became part of the institution. Um, actually, spirit murder me harder. <laughs> um, and... And it became really hard for me to, you know, here I am at this dream job and I was miserable and I'm trying to do my job in a way that doesn't feel miserable, but it could be real difficult a lot of the times. And sometimes I question if institutions of higher education are places where I could be my full self. Um, and I'm trying to figure that out and I'm lingering here. I'm not in any rush to change, but you left a tenured position. You're doing big things. Um, I don't know. Institution cannot contain all this greatness here, me uh, and a lot of us that are here. So what does that look like? Do you think, how do you think institutions could adapt to to, can, to hold and to give space for all of our greatness to thrive within them, because I would argue right now it does not. And in the event that the institution is not ready for us, which it is not, <laughs> and continues to not be, and will not allow us to transform it, what does that look like? I mean, did you feel, 
did you feel like you were just so expansive in the after the tenure situation or just speak on that for a bit, please? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for lifting up all those ideas. You're right. There's a lot of trauma and institutions have been spaces where folks have felt traumatized. One of my favorite pictures of Dr. King is him playing pool because uh, what he knew that he had to do is to have joyful outlets, to, to, to feel good and to center that throughout. I love that notion of the pleasure activism. So I think what we do is, you know, we keep using that word camp and, and I would challenge you to say, what keeps you from just doing that more what keeps you from saying you know what i'm just gonna be me or i'm gonna be more authentic or i'm gonna push the buttons a little bit more yeah i may get some pushback yeah it is possible it's not likely it's possible you might lose a job but to believe in yourself enough to bet on yourself enough to say that i could always find another job but i can't find another life this is mine and this is the life that I want to be able to have and to be who I deserve to be for me and for others. So when we say things like, well, I can't be, or they don't let me, to some degree, we allow that. And so the challenge for us is to say, what can we do step by step? It may mean we don't have to do it all at one time. Maybe we step by step work on that. But I want you to think about what can I do each day? to just 1%, like I mentioned, that 211 or 212 degrees, that one degree of difference. Maybe I just show up a little bit more authentically today or speak out a little bit more tomorrow. What are the things I can do every single day? Um, because, and again, it is tough. Institutions tend to change slower than individuals, and you have a choice. There's lots of ways that we can make our contribution. If you choose to do it through an institution like higher ed, then fight like heck to make it the best it can be then fight like heck. So let me ask Dr. Bryce for a quick second. Um, and I talk about applications, that was in the past. I want you to think he's been trying to go anywhere else. Dr. Bryce, with a you know, great doctoral degree, all this experience, all this notoriety, all these publications you have, you could have gone lots of places too. You could have easily left Highline. And I'm sure there have been people who said things like, oh, why don't you? Why don't you? I mean, Highline's too small for you. What is it either about Highline or for you that said, this is where I want to do my work? I'm curious. So for me, it has always been about, you know, the love I have for my colleagues and the love I have for my students, you know. And Highline was a special place. Like you said, it took a shot at me when nobody else would. And, you know, as we continue to lose, you know, qualified folks, especially, you know, qualified folks of color, you know, it's even more important for us to, you know, love on each other and, you know, surround ourselves, you know, with the folks that, you know, allow us and keep us, you know, doing what we're doing. So what I've tended to do towards the end of my career is to move in circles where, you know, my thoughts, my opinions, you know, are, you know, sort of respected and to not move in, you know, those other circles. And sometimes, you know, people can see that as a cop out, but for me, you know, my well-being isn't worth, you know, the energy of putting myself in circles where I know that's not gonna happen, right? Yeah, I love that because, and that's a really interesting thing to think about our work in the long term and as the life trajectory, kind of like, you know, we talk about developmental theories that there was a time there where you said, look, I have to fight those fights. I've got to speak up and say and do these things. And you maybe had that energy at that time or that passion for it at that. And maybe now, as you say, the fact that you're saying towards the end of your career, oh my God, oh my God, Daryl Rice, all grown up. Um, th to think about that maybe now you're saying, okay, this is not giving, it's saying I choose to place my energy and be in spaces that are lifted and affirm and where I know that people who are sharing that space with me need that love and affirmation too. So you're still doing life-changing work. It's just realizing at this phase, there's lots of ways to do it. So, so yeah. And Russ, I appreciate you, the chat box, it's true. The first public presentation I ever did in my life was from the high school students, a whole auditorium. And three minutes left my presentation, a younger man was like, oh, your fly's down, your zipper's down. I was like, oh my God. And they laughed at me. And the principal actually came up to me afterwards and said, you'll never come back here again. Because the kids got so out of control. They literally ran out of the auditorium laughing. It was my first time ever speaking. Uh, so that's a great thing about Zoom. I don't have to worry. If my fly's down now, you'll never know. Uh, but the point is, like, we're going to face challenge. You can get bitter, you can get better. Right? Some of this that is happening in this world right now, maybe we need because it's recentering us. This pandemic has taught us a lot about what we need to honor in our lives. It's given us new strategies to communicate. 
right? We're able to view and engage with people all over the world in ways we didn't before. And even in the midst of challenge, see those moments, see this anti spirit that we're seeing in this country right now as a moment to galvanize us, to reach out to each other and love a little bit harder. See this as our wake up call that maybe we got a little comfortable. Maybe we've been living in a, in a space where we thought, yeah, hey, we're making progress. No, we need to keep that fight going and be in the spaces that give you what you need. Uh, how do clever folks who say they want to be equal, they're, they're in social on the line? A couple of things. One, don't be afraid again to you know, speak and give examples and raise your voice. Another thing, give evidence. One of the things we don't do a really good enough job, I think, in this work is to demonstrate the research about how you know, inclusive spaces make us better or the examples of how when we bring in you know, diverse faculty, look, we're a better faculty. Right? So I, I think what you can do is think about concrete examples, whether it's through data, specific numbers or experiences or stories, demonstrate to people that actually this works. It's not just because it's nice. It's not just because you know, it's the right thing to do. All that matters. It's also true that it benefits, that it makes us better. So for those folks who don't quite get it, speak to it, give them examples to model that so they can see it and, and understand that sometimes fear is real. And one of the things I've discovered in my work during this pandemic is there's so many faculty that struggled to do the Zoom thing and everything else, not because they didn't care about students, not that they didn't want to learn, but what if you've been teaching for 30 years and you're afraid? You, you don't know this technology. You don't want to be embarrassed. It's, it's tough for us. None of us want to feel embarrassed. So for so many people, change is scary. And maybe if we just sit and talk to people and have a chance to hear their story, maybe their resistance or maybe their acts that are not aligning with what they're saying is because they don't know or they're afraid. And we can be the shepherds to bring them to the next level. So thanks for the story um, that, was, that was mentioned there. Um, I love for, uh, you know, this wonderful, this big, gorgeous brain and your advocacy for the underdog is transcendent. <sighs> I just want to, I want to like, I just want to bathe in that idea right there, right? Isn't it wonderful that we've got people in our midst? So those moments you start saying that, you know, the institution, and I'm not speaking about highlights, I've been there as so I can't say anything good or bad about now. I just know that I, when I was there, it was a place that was so special to me. If you are saying the institution isn't giving you, then these folks are the institution too. Daryl Bryce is Highline College. Gumlai Ross is Highline. The institution is not just the people at the various positions in administration or the buildings. The institution is the people and move to affirm and inspire them so we can continue, because you have no idea people are watching. I just want to remind you that when we think nothing is happening, the bamboo tree takes five years to grow above ground, and you think nothing's going on, and it shoots out 90 feet in six weeks. The bamboo tree for five years has to anchor itself, and when it's ready, it shoots out. Some of us, we think that we don't see the change happening. Maybe we're just anchoring ourselves. Some of us, uh, maybe we, we've been scared for years I had talked about coming out, and I didn't do it. Is nothing happening? No, I was anchoring myself. And when I was ready, I could do that. For some of us to realize that what might look like no change is really the universe telling us we're getting you ready so that when change is about to happen, you're better positioned to experience that. So, so I really appreciate all that, that folks are, are saying and, and uh, the comments here in the chat box. I just, maybe we could take the last two minutes for everybody just to drop some wisdom in the chat box. Drop a thought, a comment, an idea, a feeling, anything that you want to offer to the space. Let's just take the last 90 seconds. You don't need to hear my voice anymore. Let's hear each other's voices. Let's hear each other's voices with thoughts of encouragement, insights, words of wisdom. Maybe it came from your grandmother. Maybe it came from something you read once. Or maybe it just came from your own soul and brain. Let's put in the chat box the words we need to hear at this moment. I'm glad we're recording this. Maybe we could, Dr. Bryce, if somebody can grab and go through some of these chats and maybe we can create a little document to send as a reminder of all the love that people have shared. I don't know if there's a way to do it so that someone doesn't have to sit there and type every single one of these out. Maybe there's technology to make it easier. 
let's keep dropping them in the chat box because our collective wisdom is so strong. Geese fly in V formation because they know that they go 71% faster by flying together. That's how we get better together. Thunderbirds, we fly together. And you are, as Izzy said, enough. So I thank you so much for the chance to be able to be with you. I'm going to go run up a floor and go talk about storytelling to folks and, and getting people engaged and just sharing and being together as a family. What an amazing, amazing place this is. Dr. Bryce, I love you. I'm inspired by you. Every time I read these chats or sometimes I do, you know, i be honest, sometimes I go on ratemyprofessor.com and I just read Daryl Bryce's reviews because I just want to, I love seeing and hearing people celebrate each other. I love, I love going to religious services that I maybe know nothing about and, and watching people, not, it's not about the religion, it's about the spirit where people feel affirmed and, and love on each other. I love to, to be in place, I love showing up to random events and just watching a play. And even if I don't know anything about the author, I can watch people just be amazing and gifted at what they do. And we show up for each other, show up for each other and, and catch each other being good. It's life affirming, especially when folks have felt marginalized, especially in a world that tries to tell you you don't belong and you matter. Hail to the no. You matter. You belong. And the world needs you. So thanks again. I just want to thank Dr. Greenfield again. Man, thank you so much. Much love coming back your way. Appreciate you squeezing us in. Right. You're always welcome. You know, you can always come home. Right. I love it. So thank you, Dr. Greenfield. Before thanks, everybody, everybody go. Please join us this week for more programs. Join us tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. with Being Here, Being Human, and they will be sharing on brief literacy. You know, there's more information in Zoom links. And thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Much love to everyone.